Good morning. I'm uh, Jim Ji from uh, Texas A&M University. I'm a program co-chair of the conference with uh, Jeff Dirk. So in the past four days, I hope you have uh, enjoyed and participated in uh, these uh, exciting scientific and ed educational presentations. And um, today, it's my distinct honor and great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, one of the most influential leaders in the global healthcare industry, Dr. Richard Hausman, President and CEO of Global MR Business of GE Healthcare. Dr. Hausman started his career as an engineer in magnetic resonance and Siemens in the late 1980s. He contributed to some uh, seminal application development in geography and fast imaging. He went on having 23 years of uh, distinguished service at Siemens, holding a number of leadership positions, such as the director of uh, MR application development, vice president for sales and marketing for Siemens MRI, then CT business, president and CEO of Siemens Healthcare CT business. Very notably, um, he actually is the president and CEO of, a, uh, of a Siemens regional company in China and Northeast Asia for five years, where he doubled the sales and was finally responsible for an 8 billion euro business of Siemens in that part of the world. He was most recently the CEO of a Siemens Smart Grid Application and E-Mobility Project uh, in the, for the Siemens Energy. Uh, in that role, he formed, led, and created three business units in the US, China, and Europe. Last night, um, Dr. Hausman told me that he had gone visiting the rural Sichuan area uh, in China after the earthquake happened in that region in the year of 2008. I can imagine that he has many first-hand experience in different parts of the world. Many have not fully benefited from the modern imaging and healthcare technology that most of us contributed and benefited and take for granted. He's indeed a former fine engineer, just as one of us, who has become a prominent leader at the two top global healthcare companies, a leader with a true global perspective and vision. Please join me in welcome Dr. Hausman for his keynote address on innovations on MRI. much, Jim, for this very kind introduction. Um, and uh, it's always good to hear the whole life again, right? At least a professional one. Um, yeah, I would like to kind of share with you a few insights in uh, what we at GE Healthcare MR, and actually GE in total a little bit too, are doing in terms of innovation. You know, I mean, the you're, you probably hear it every day. Um, the healthcare market is definitely not a a real flourishing right now one because of all the restrict, uh, reductions in reimbursement rates for example here in the United States uh, markets are slow in the developed countries thanks God they are pretty dynamic in the emerging markets like China so um, it is very important uh, to consider and we believe very strongly in that that still innovation is a very important part to drive our business success at the end of the day innovation which actually really helps our customers to perform better. And not only at the high-end level, but also kind of creating the new markets, rural healthcare markets, uh, and other patient groups. And that's what I would like to kind of share with you, what we do, how do we kind of understand the markets, take the technologies and kind of bring the, bring the field forward. Uh, we still believe very much, and I personally believe very much, starting in 88 in MR, that MR is one of the most fascinating technologies which ever invented and are still under development. Uh, because there are so many disciplines of physics 
uh, and engineering at the cutting edge integrated into a state of the art MR scanner. Um, and that's really fascinating. And actually, the other thing which also motivates us very much every day and the whole team uh, around the world is that we help basically patients and, and doctors every day with the machines. Every second, basically, there is an aspect of uh, doing good. And so there is no wonder that the MR is actually MRI and MR spectroscopy is a, is a, is a, is a technology where four Nobel Prizes have been awarded to. I don't, I don't know of any other technology but where that happened, you know. So starting this uh, block in Purcell uh, on the principle of MR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and then uh, Richard Ernst and uh, Peter Mans and Paul Lauderbur and Kurt Wüderich on spectroscopy and especially with Mansfield and Laudabur on the imaging side. So it's amazing, uh, four Nobel Prizes in medicine, in physics, and in chemistry. So nothing else I know of which would, would ha where, where that happened. MR is not a real old technology, actually, at least in the form of MR imaging. So I, as you probably recall, there's around about 30 years, or 31 years now, this year, when the first high field, really clinical high field MR scanner was introduced in 1983. So what is the key success factor of making an innovation really a good solution? So um, I strongly believe that, uh, and that's why I talk to you as engineers, so to say, as uh, inventors, uh, that technical innovation uh, is still the key driver. Of course, we have to talk to customers, we have to talk to the markets, and we have to kind of uh, also consider competitive moves. But at the end of the day, we cannot assume that our customers know what would be possible in five years from now, technology-wise, and in that sense, to help them to do their job better, if we are not bringing out those innovations and confront our customers early on with those new innovative ideas, and then create together with those customers the real solutions. So we have essentially I have to answer the question, not what the customer want and need, but what would the customer want and need if he or she would know what is technology possible in five years from now. Because the time frame to develop something is that time frame. So this, bringing this together, this is the key idea. And then of course you have to be fast, and I think there is a, a nice uh, quote from John F. Kennedy, uh, a large advantage you have in life if you act while others are still debating. That's very important. Uh, of course big companies usually have a tendency to debate long time, but uh, it's very important, even in a big company, to make a small, move, a small part like the MR move fast. So, 30 years ago, that's how MRs looked in the Global Research Center at GE in Schenectady. Uh, and you probably remember, or may remember, or maybe you're too young for that, that uh, the first 1.5 Tesla, what was called, what was called high field MR, was uh, coming uh, in 1983, was on the floor of the RSNA. Uh, that was quite exciting, also we don't talk about high field MR with 1.5 Tesla anymore, as you know, but it's still exciting, like in the first days. The last 30 years have been different phases of innovations, and that right now, actually, we are in a, in, a, in a somewhat different phase of technology development as, of course, it was in the early days. So in the 80s, so the MR systems were developed at high field. Superconducting magnets had to be kind of created active shielded gradients, shielded gra active shielded magnets, shielded gradients, basic image, uh, imaging applications have been developed. In the 90s then, the gradients have been improved. The gradients are, as, we, as you probably know, are the lens, kind of the resolution driver, which we need to make better images and faster images. Then multi-coil RF systems have been in the early development. And then advanced applications, fast spin echo, turbo spin echo, called by other companies, MRN geography, echo plane imaging, functional MRI have been generated. I still remember when I was in the, in the lab uh, that I didn't believe that this functional MRI is really working, so I went in the magnet uh, and uh, one of my colleagues did the experiment and I would do fingertipping and uh, after I, kind of, I think an hour or something and a lot of reconstructions, he showed me a picture of my uh, uh, of the brain and really the activation zone. I was really convinced that this is a, has a great future, and it went quite some way uh, uh, from then on. 
In the, in the next 10 years, around 2000 to 2010, the advanced RF coils and parallel imaging have been introduced. A big milestone, actually, in MR imaging, making it very, very much faster or, or in the other, other way, higher resolution, better signal to noise. Refinement in gradients came, disease-specific disease applications were growing. Today, and in those, this century, actually, Non-Fourier imaging, sparse sampling, compressed sensing, quantitative MRI and visualization are the topics. And what comes up more and more, and I think what is more and more important in the, in the, in the, in the world of productivity pressure is workflow, patient comfort, one-touch ideas, whiteboard systems, and as you probably heard about, silent MRI, quiet MRI scanners. So those are the things which basically have been the trends of the last 10 years. And the outcomes of those trends are phenomenal, actually. On the right-hand side, you see an MR angio without contrast agent, totally done silent. Not only quiet, silent, on a regular MR scan. Uh, Maverick SL is a, is a technology which I would have said 30 years ago when I started, never possible to scan metal in a... Uh, in a uh, non ferromagnetic metal in, a, in an MR, even that. But now with new pulse sequence designs, uh, spectral imaging, you can make an image uh, uh, around the implant and, and uh, clinicians can sort out if there is an issue or not. And focus is a technology which is also interesting because it's so contra intuitive for MR that you can really focus in into a smaller field of view without getting all the wraparound that you have to live with and have high resolution, in this case, in the pelvic uh, example, overlaid with a diffusion-related image. So quite amazing things happened where physicists probably said at some point, oh, maybe that's not possible. So I learned never say not possible. Um, another tendency which was just recently coming out very strongly is combining MR with functional imaging, functional, truly functional imaging in the sense of PET imaging. and. Um, uh, we actually were other companies early on, but we have actually you now also created the system very much integrated with a totally new time of flight detector and have kind of uh, put it in place at three sites already for our FDA studies and the system is now FDA submitted, but not their product. So uh, the interesting thing about this is that you can combine the best imaging technology with the best contrast, MR, with uh, actually a time of flight based, high sensitive, newest detector technology in PET, and this way combine those worlds in a very much ideal way. Um, the technology of the detector actually is visualized a little bit here. It's a solid state detector, um, and uh, it has significant higher sensitivity and a high time resolution, so that this high time resolution allows you to do the time of flight experiment, which means uh, a better signal to noise. And this is just an example out of one of those clinical test case, test sites, where, uh, of course, the protocol is always to say, hey, first we do in the, in the, the injection of the tracer, then we do PET, MR, PET CT, and then the, pa the patient with the same injection was transferred to the PET MR, and the scan was done with PET MR. So if you look at those two PET images alone, one from the PET CT and one from the PET MR, you can clearly see that the signal to noise is better on the PET MR, although it was taken one hour after the injection, where the decay was already significant. Now combining that with the MR images rather than the CT images, I believe that this is really a way to go forward uh, in, the, in the clinical setting. In this case, for oncology patient, you see these two uh, 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 tumors in the, in the lung. Uh, of course, where MR is then really, really helpful is in the brain. Uh, and uh, this is a case of another case uh, from the University of Zurich, um, where there was um, breast cancer, primary breast cancer, and there was a metas metastasis developing in the brain. And with uh, the PET MR uh, and the PET, especially the PET, you can clearly highlight that. Um, uh, in the way you want to see it. So this is a new tendency. Those systems are complicated. They are again very demanding from a technology point of view. 
you can imagine that those detect pet detectors inside an MR scanner where gradients are jumping back and forth and magnets are there and eddy currents and all this kind of stuff have to be temperature controlled in a way beyond expectation and uh, and those things need to be managed. This is a huge task for engineers uh, and a very exciting task for engineers, but it can be done. And that's why we have this product now out. There's another very interesting technology for functional imaging, which even doesn't need a nuclear tracers. And this is hyperpolarized C13 imaging, which we believe also is, a, is an interesting way to go forward, definitely on a research basis. But what we try to do is to help the researchers and the groups doing that experiments with a more clinical setting for the polarization. So the idea there is pretty simple. Instead of using the hydrogen uh, nuclei for signal generation, you use a C13, an, a, a natural isotope of, of carbon, uh, non-radioactive. Uh, non uh, and, and what you do, you hyperpolarize. So basically, you, you, you increase the number of spins you have available uh, by a hundred thousand factor. Yeah? Um, and, and in this way you have the signal to noise which you need, uh, which you usually have already with the hydrogen atom, but you have it now with another injected uh, uh, agent. Uh, for example, pyruvate, where the C13 is then kind of put in. Uh, if you do that, actually you have to be very fast because the polarization is gone after two minutes. So, uh, but the results actually are, are very, very encouraging. This is a result from the University of California, San Francisco on a prostate uh, and uh, using pyruvate uh, injection. And you can clearly see uh, the enhancement in the, uh, in the cancerous part of, uh, uh, of the prostate. Uh, and then, actually, during that experiment, the pyruvate decays into lactate. And for you in working in MR spectroscopy, of course, that's, everything is known about that. But in this way, you actually generated is this in, a, in an imaging experiment. Um, and you can really differentiate how active parts of the tumors are. So what we provide, actually, is a so-called spin lab polarizer. That's a, another very high-techy product, to be honest. It's again a nuclear, using nuclear overhauser effect to polarize uh, those carbon-13 uh, nuclei. It's uh, quite auto automized. It doesn't need a sterile environment anymore, so you can place it basically very close to the MR scanner. It has integrated quality control and can, can polarize four probes at one time. So with that, you have to be close to the MR, do this, run it, inject, and then do the experiment and it will be a way forward also to do functional imaging even without nuclear traces. Uh, very interesting aspect of research right now. Now, this is today. And what I want to talk in the majority of my, my time is what are the technology trends for MR to, in the, into the future? So what are the things which are of relevance? How can we solve customer problems? And I will focus on four points. One is uh, the aspect of uh, zero cryogen magnets. We all know that uh, uh, mag uh, MR is actually the field where superconductivity is used to, the, to an extent larger than any other application, I would say. Right? So also the cryogens are used. So we are suffering a little bit from the increased pricing and the scarcity of cry uh, helium. Uh, I'll show you a solution for that. Then I would like to go into one example which is really interesting in terms of enlarging the group of patients which we can cope with, with MR, and going into the idea of neonatal MR. Workflow automation is a very important piece of our uh, innovation strategy. I will co uh, cover that one. And then a step forward, and let, going a little bit outside even MR, and a bigger picture, the big data, uh, everybody talks about big data, uh, applications and how they can help us in MR and in the healthcare world uh, in the future. So let's talk a little bit about zero low or low cryogen magnets. I always call them zero, but my lawyer has said told me that I have to put the uh, uh, <laughs> quotation marks there uh, because it actually you never touch the helium which is in there uh, uh, and it's it's actually completely sealed. 
So in that sense, for the customer, it's, it's zero cryogen magnet. So what is it? So in, in normal magnets, which we use for MR scanners everywhere around the world, besides maybe the very small experimental systems uh, in, in, in animal experiments, uh, what you have is actually a, a tank of liquid helium uh, surrounding the uh, superconducting wires uh, which drive the magnetic field. Um, typically, you need 5,000 liters of liquid helium um, to fill a magnet and probably 3,000 for a 1.5 or 5,000 for a, a 3 Tesla magnet to run it. And you have to keep that there all the time. The idea of a low cryogen magnet or a zero cryogen magnet actually is to get rid of this helium bath in the sense that you don't use liquid helium, you, you use only, you, do, you use conduction cooling of the superconducting wires uh, and uh, you use a little bit of helium actually um, uh, to like 10 liters in our case which is condensed gas uh, but it is ne it's once filled, never touched again. Really never touched again. It's really in a complete, uh, 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 even if it quenches, nothing happens to it. So, um, so that's quite a different design. And as you can see on this layout is, and the patent application, it is a completely different look and feel of a magnet, to be honest, and especially if you go into the details. And what are the advantages? It's much easier to cite because as I said, even if it quenches, it doesn't quench with a huge blow-off of helium. It, it is just kind of intrinsically quenching. Everything stays intact. So no pipes necessary to go outside of the hospital or wherever. Um, so that's, uh, that's a key thing. Then it's less weight because you don't have the helium in. Um, and, uh, and it's way less sensitive to vibrations, by the way. It's a plug and play. You can, you can make it low cost. You can transport it everywhere in the world. You get it there, you plug it into the, into the, into the uh, uh, outlet, and then it cools down. Um, so quite different to pouring in liquid helium and kind of cooling it down, cooling it down, and then boil off helium and cooling it down again, and so, so those kind of things. It's a sealed system, completely sealed. Um, for life. I mean, if you ever have to touch the system inside, you better exchange the whole manual. Um, and you never have to add helium, so the service is much easier. So no refill, um, uh, no potential for icing, those kind of stuff, and ramping and settling is much faster. So huge advantages, which again, if you think about customers, allows us to go into rural areas, for example, with those magnets, much easier than we would do without, uh, with, with normal ones. And the whole complexity is way less. There are some key technologies necessary to make this happen, to be honest. It's, it sounds pretty easy. Everybody would think why oh, nobody did it up to now. Uh, but it, there are a lot of details in there. And I, I don't want and I don't go into the details, but I just want to say that there's a lot of precision necessary to make this happen, both from the winding of the coils as well as the coil structures. Um, a lot of material knowledge is necessary as well because this conduction cooling and all those kind of uh, temperature properties inside the magnet have to be managed very, very well. Uh, there are some special technologies necessary for the power leads and there is also necessary to decouple the gradient coil and the magnet to the extent from the eddy current point of view which is uh, higher than uh, uh, in the normal magnet. So normal gradient coil technology is also used to do this magnet. But if you finally look at those magnets uh, and compare it to a normal one, you see that they are, well, number one, much smaller uh, from the form factor point of view, look different also from the form factor, uh, uh, compared to uh, a normal system which you see on the right side. Uh, this is actually a 1.5 Tesla magnet, a 60 centimeter patient bore and a completely uh, standard magnet which can be used for a system and we can actually combine the radio with the system and you see the, f the images coming out of that system. So this is a huge advantage for the future uh, and it can be a paradigm and I, I believe it will be a paradigm shift in MR magnets because it, has, it allows to go MRs go to places, I mean to places where we never thought about, you know. 
uh, it makes MR can make, make MR more affordable because not only from the purchasing price of the scanner but also from the service benefits. Yeah, easier service, easier life cycle, uh, lower life cycle costs. And last but not least, it allows also new form factors uh, because if you're not kind of kind of fixed to those bases of helium, you can do much different things uh, to make uh, magnets look different. So uh, it allows us also to go special ways. And uh, there's one application which we actually working on together with uh, Mayo Clinic and uh, uh, Nation and, uh, the uh, National Institute of Biomagnetic Imaging and uh, Biomagnetism. And, and, and uh, this is a three Tesla MR system, very compact, high cryogen free. Um, and uh, in combining this uh, with actually the highest performance gradient system you can think about. Now the program objectives, and that is done at the, actually at our uh, global research center, and again in Schenectady, where the first 1.5 Tesla magnet was made. Uh, and uh, again, it's lightweight magnet, total cost of ownership low, but we now combine that not for going places, we combine that for going new applications and drive the envelope on slew rates and gradient performance. And for that, the team developed a new gradient coil, which actually allows particularly imaging and new applications in the brain. Other than that, it's a standard system, uh, kind of like a three Tesla 750W system from the electronics point of view. The idea of the new gradient technology is actually an asymmetric gradient coil. The problem with, with gradient performance actually is not so much the technology, it's more the body. As we all know, if you go too high in slew rate, so switching too fast, the gradients, or going too high in amplitude, or going, doing both, uh, you get stimulations, peripheral nerve stimulations. And you have to monitor that very carefully. The idea of this new technology is now to say, hey, let's focus only on Let's focus only on the head or the brain and make it the gradient coil, which you see in green here, asymmetric so that the homogeneous or the linear field of the gradient is actually not in the middle of the gradient, but it's more on the one side of the gradient so that the shoulders are not hindering you when you go in. Okay? So the shoulders and the whole body actually is completely outside the gradient field. This can allow you actually to go higher in slew rates without peripheral nerve stimulations. That's a simple idea, actually. Uh, but a normal head insert wouldn't make it. The asymmetry actually helps you a lot because uh, of the shoulders. Um, so that's the idea. Now, if you look at this graphics here, this is actually a stimulation threshold. Here is the uh, amplitude and here is the slew rate. So how high you switch and how fast you switch. And the red one is actually a normal whole body magnet. And that's basically the limit. So you have to stay below that. If you do this asymmetric gradient coil, you can go up to the green, green line. So that means a lot, actually, because there are two aspects of, of uh, performance for gradients. One is the slew rate, so how fast do you switch? If you want to go echoplanar and you do typical echoplanar imaging and want to reduce the individual uh, echo spacings, you need those slew rates. And uh, this is basically the point where we go with the system. And you see you can go way up in slew rate and even way up in, in amplitude. Uh, and that allows you completely new applications, right? And reduces the distortions in echoplanar imaging, reduces all kinds of things, the blurring, the image quality just gets significantly better and allows you for new applications in the brain. This is the advantages of the gradient amplitude, same thing. Here is our uh, prototype system. And uh, with this uh, higher gradient amplitude, you have just better diffusion varied imaging. You have shorter TE times, and that increases signal to noise. So you see that you combine two things. One is the low cryogen, zero cryogen magnet, ease of siding, ease of form factor, small magnet, and this gradient coil, and you get really into a, into a system which uh, and this is a prototype picture of it, which allows you to do new things in the brain. Uh, way beyond, actually, of what maybe other, other 
others call high performance gradients because there you're still limited by the peripheral nerve stimulation. And there's a good chance that this will cope with it. So that's just an idea going really the extra mile in gradient performance. And this is also a completely experimental system and, uh, and we're very happy to work together with Mayo Clinic to do some clinical evaluation on that one. The second, second uh, example I wanted to give you is a, another one. It's more related to how do we get the right solution in a field where we have not used or not extensively used MR in the past. And uh, that's related to our circle of birth. And of course, in this stage uh, of, uh, of growth, you, you can use normal MR scanners. Although they are not released actually, officially, at least in the United States, for, uh, for this application. But uh, you can use normal suppression, motion suppression technologies and can create excellent images in this case of a 19 week fetus. With real time imaging and with uh, some other uh, navigation technology. But what happens in the, in the, in the case of a preterm birth, where those very fragile uh, uh, neonates uh, have, have, have also a benefit of being examined in a mask and actually non-invasively. The problem at that point in time is that usually the MRs are located in the radiology department, not in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. So different environment, you know, uh, complicated long procedures block even the regular MR system, the productivity goes down there. Several NICU personnel has to come with the baby etc etc. System is not optimized for the tiny and fragile no neonates and even if you have an incubator which is MR compatible it's still a hassle to do the experiment and it's not done in the, to the extent which I think would be necessary. So what we try to do is actually with a new method of development uh, which we call FastWorks uh, to, to come to a solution what can be offered to the which can be offered to the market. Uh, the idea is actually uh, funded also by, in part by the Wellcome Trust in the UK uh, and what we used here is, is, is kind of a more entrepreneurial way forward in a big company, <laughs> um, which is not easy but it works. Uh, and there was a book out uh, from Eric Ries which called The Lean Startup and maybe some of you read it, but it's really interesting to read, it's the idea of iterative development. Uh, in software, you do that, you call that agile development sometimes, but in hardware, it's actually a little bit more difficult, especially in the field of healthcare where FDA regulations have to be kept in place and have to be fulfilled. You know? And there's another book, uh, the Startup Playbook, which, uh, from David Keeter, which he kind of inhaled. But the idea is basically the following FastWorks is a set of tools and principles and behaviors that allows us actually to get closer to customers in a very, very early stage of development, extremely early stage of development, especially for new customers, being it new customers like a NICU nurse or NICU doctors, or being customers in very rural areas also, eh, where other needs are, are, are there, we, we choose for this pro project now the NICU. Uh, speed to market increase, increase change of, change of success and make it easy to get things done. That's important. So the circle is the following. You start with an understanding uh, what the customer really needs by deeply involving yourself and in interviewing them. Then, then you kind of create a leap of faith. So what is the assumption actually or the goal you want to achieve with this development? Then you define what, what you call the minimum viable product. So not the full solution, but what would make it go, so to say, and what you could sell although it might not be ideal yet, and you try it out. Establish learning from uh, uh, learning metrics. Actually, you have to really, before you start, think about what you want to learn and what are the criteria you say, let's go forward or let's stop or modify, okay? So it's, it's very important to do it before. Because usually engineering projects have the tendency to be just going on, going on, going on, and uh, you run the problems, you solve it, and you go on, and you go on. But you never know if you really want to go that direction at, and reach the final stage. And then, at some point, you have to ask yourself in a team, do you want to pivot, change a little bit, or stop it, 
or persevere and go forward and bring it to a product. So that's the, that's the philosophy. And we implemented that for the neonatal project now. So started intense discussions, made up a minimum viable product, critical prototypes, mark, experiment in the market, iterate and learn, and go forward. So the first thing is very important in those projects is that you, you, you create an environment of entrepreneurship by moving those people together in, separate, in a separate environment. That's a physical thing. And, but, but very important because it has to be a little bit entrepreneurial environment even in a big company. Second thing is uh, define what you want to really do. Deliver a dedicated MRI scan inside in the NICU. That was important. Into the NICU, yeah? making MRI accessible to babies who currently cannot receive MRI exams as a result of safety and practicality barriers. And I mean, those babies are very, very small and very, very fragile. And you see here that they are connected to all kinds of life support equipment. So it is a completely different field. Then you create your leap of faith assumption in more detail. Is a market there, you know, is a siding and, and, and um, patient impact enough, business model, technology, and a growth idea. Don't go into all the details. Then we started. And we started with, what, which, with the system which we had. We took as much as possible what, what we had. And we had actually at that time a small 1.5 Tesla knee scanner magnet. And we took that electronics and all this kind of system which we had moved that to three Tesla with the Megan manufacturer and, tr and kind of elevated it, put a kind of incubator surrounding it and you see that how it evolved into a, into a clinical prototype version. Then we did a thing which uh, last year at the RSNA we, we said, oh, what is the best, where is, what is the best thing to, best way to get the feedback? And we said, we said oh, well, let's put it at the show in a way that it is a feedback. That it, does it make sense or not? So basically an open question. And this was amazing. More than a thousand customers actually gave us very valuable feedback at that show. And there was a very clear feedback at that time that the bore size was too small. Okay? So for example, so larger bore was a large requirement then the cost versus utilization issue need to work, be, be worked out. So some people said also that small babies, not pre-born, but newborns, should also be access, uh, 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 possible to be scanned in that one. So we worked on that, we got back to the engineering, got back and said, okay, what's possible? And the, and the next step was that from this, what we showed, we moved to a little bit bigger magnet we move to a more developed product now and, and kind of integrate that feedback. Um, so that's the way to do it. And then those things are now developed. And in parallel, actually, we are now putting out these early prototypes, two of them, into the clinical setting and learn from there. Knowing already that the bore size will be bigger, but all the other things actually are very much the same. So that's an idea. Uh, the feedback was extremely positive um, and uh, we're looking forward together with our customers and with all the partners which we are working together with to create a product which will enlarge the usage of MR into the future, uh, bringing it to the NICU directly. Um, so that's another new idea in MR. Now, as I said, there's a lot, even in this new QMR, by the way, a lot of issues on workflow are, have to be solved. For example, uh, handling all the lines, which you saw. Not only handling the lines out of the magnet, but also out of the RF room. And there are little things which need to be considered um, in an environment which is different to a radiology department. But what we are focusing also on is overall workflow automation and, um, and development. And it's not just because we like it. I think it's also because there is a tendency that we have new users and we have actually also less educated users in MR. 
It's not the time 30 years ago where every tech, every doctor knew everything about T1, T2 and everything, you know, and the full MR physics. That's over. So we have to get to a form of protocol generation and usage and interaction with a system which is way, way easier than it is today. So COPE is new user groups. Integrate state of the art usage models and prepare for big data applications. That's our uh, idea. Now, what are the challenges today? I mean, challenges are different from whom you talk to. The radiologist has special challenges. Um, uh, the technologist, uh, as a primary user, um, is of course the one which is most important for the workflow aspect at the scanner. So, um, and I, I put it here, how to learn MR physics, and I think you don't have to learn MR physics to run an MR scanner in the, fu in the future at all anymore, in my opinion. It should, it should be handled automatically. Uh, the patient also, by the way, has a say, and uh, typically examinations are still too long and still too noisy, uh, and silent is helping there, but still there's other ways of getting more comfortable experience for patients, for example, in-room and in-bore displays, etc., going into the future with new technologies. So, our, our three main initiatives are an intuit, much more intuitive way of doing things. Touch screen user interfaces. Um, it's interesting to see that I remember 30 years ago, our first MR scanners had all the touch screens. Uh, <laughs> then we went away and used mouses and everything. Uh, I think the, the, the world is going back to touch screen, as we all know, from our iPhones and iPods. Um, and, uh, but it's in a different way, of course, in a much more elaborate way. So this is gesture, uh, speech recognition, simplification of a very complex task. Um, uh, it must be much more interactive, uh, interactive with the patients and also interactive with the scanner, inboard experience for the patients, table, uh, device interconnectivity, and those kind of stuff is very important to solve. And then expert systems and computer aided uh, uh, or computer help uh, for uh, rules, um, um, avoiding errors by the user, provide a safety net in case of a quick change of the tech, for example, uh, having educational capabilities, why shouldn't an MR scanner is a self-learning scanner, why do we still do have to do huge application training, you know, those kind of things are very important for us from looking into the future from a technology point of view. We all live already with completely different user interfaces every day on our personal devices. If I got come to the scan rooms, and that's independent of the, co of, of the company, to be honest, uh, at the provider, uh, it, for me it still looks like uh, the old way. Yeah? So we have to go miles there. And why not tailor it to the MR technologies? Why not tailor it to the profile uh, of the individual using the scanner and even diagnosing on the scanner if you talk about the radiologist. So uh, the experts can still be experts, but the non-experts get the help they need to have. And there is really a lot to be done, and I think it's, it's, just, it's just coming in the next few years. Very big move into that direction. The technology benefits are immense, actually. Um, it, it simplifies, uh, the reprodu reproducibility re simplifies reporting. Um, it streamlines, streamlines the workflow for the doctors and also the productivity is improved. Uh, for the techs, um, of course it makes more fun and works, have, having fun at work is always good. Uh, and, and it helps solving problems. So it, you, it's not you you solve the problem, but the system helps you solve the problem. And the continuous learning is also possible. Why are our scanners not connected to the internet? I know that there are patient safety and privacy things to be solved, and they will be solved. Uh, and, and then actually the whole, the whole World Wide Web, the big data on the web can be used and should be used in a more smarter way to help individual users of an MR scanner to cope with, uh, with the patient. Um, and of course for the patient, uh, examinations will be more interactive and they will also be less, uh, uh, less timely and, and quieter. Um, so our workflow initiatives are based on uh, a software which we prepare ourselves as a company actually, as GE as a company, 
uh, for the big data revolution and the in industrial internet. Uh, and it's very much related to a complete, um, we call it lasagna style, lasagna design, uh, architecture of software, where we will allow actually also, uh, we will try to allow the, the users, the partners, to also develop on that scanner. Yeah, develop new stuff and integrate it, like on the apps world, you know, on the iPhone and the Android. So that basically nobody should wait until we as big company do everything for, for you, but we would like to provide a technology which enables, so to say, uh, a more worldwide development uh, and a partnership. And there will be much more intelligent software necessary for the scanners. So, um, for example, parameter, parameter optimization. We all know that MR is, is, as I said, a nice, but also a complicated technology, great technology. And if you change one parameter, the other parameter, uh, the, 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 you can do a lot of mistakes, yeah? So uh, there are expert systems which we have in our labs already, which uh, really help you to optimize that, to, to kind of be seamless in the parameter changes and uh, transfer that learning also across MR systems. Protocol management in big uh, imaging chains and hospitals is a very critical thing. We hear it every day. How, why can I not have the same protocols all over? Why can I not centrally distribute protocols? Why can I not standardize everything? And those things will happen in a very short time frame. And platformless. So the idea of the, inter, uh, of the global development is actually the first step which we have implemented now is in a, in a way an open software where the world can or the partners can develop for all, not for us, for all. And uh, this is what we call orchestra software. It's the first step only of a certain milestones process. Uh, it's a, so a software development kit which allows, for example, users uh, to use their own MATLAB and C++ codes and integrate into the reconstruction of the GE scanners completely in line. And uh, this reduces tremendously the efforts uh, which are need to be done both from our partners as well as from us, actually, when we do internal development. So this is a way, a first step to allow development and co direct implementation at the same time uh, uh, for us as, as for our customers or kind of collaboration customers. Um, and we would like to, uh, we will actually enlarge that possibilities into the future, including post-processing uh, and also user interface changes. Because some of the user interfaces have to be also kind of personalized and this can also be a way forward. Necessary for that is actually this layered structure of a software uh, which goes into the, into the future. Now, uh, this is a first step actually to open software development to kind of allow more everybody to contribute and this brings me to my last point, this is the big data applications uh, in MR or actually in healthcare or actually in various fields of industry. And what is it? Uh, big data applications, I mean, it's, it's, it's the idea of get completely connected, not as people but as machines, or components of machines, the internet of things. Uh, of course, there's always necessary to use the data in a secure and smart way, and you can create new and breakthrough business models and applications by doing so. Just think about what happened when one billion people got connected, right? That's today, okay? We are one billion are connected. Uh, the consumer internet, so to say. Uh, Facebook, Amazon, so social marketing emerged, social networks emerged, I, I mean, entertainment is digitalized, retail and ad is transformed, communication is completely mobilized, yeah? um, and ID, IT arch architecture is virtualized. So huge things happened where nobody in the room probably 20 years ago would have imagined what, hap what, what is happening. Now, if you think when 20, 50 billion machines are connected, or will be connected, in the various fields of industry, including healthcare, for example, uh, on the left side you see um, 
transportation uh, in industry, uh, Internet of Things, meaning locomotives, subways, um, uh, communication centers. Uh, so the brilliant Yale rail yard, for example, is, is the idea of the Internet of Things on the transportation side. Um, brilliant hospitals. Um, taking basically uh, every component of healthcare delivery, including medicine, um, to to be to be uh, to be traceable, yeah, to be basically connected with RFIDs or whatever. Brilliant power. I was personally working on the smart grid idea, where in today's world we have a different situation that with wind and solar. You know, the generation is not necessarily always matching the demand. So you have to get more intelligent. You have to involve a lot of parameter sensors and components into the system to optimize the generation delivery of energy. And the same is true for factories. Factories are pretty much digitalized already, but they can be even more digitalized. Logistics optimizations, factory optimization, continuous and discrete production optimization. So a lot of things will happen there where new, new applications will come into the game. In healthcare, actually, you have it already today, not in MR, but in other fields. If you, for example, call the Nike Fuel Band a healthcare device, which you can, yeah. So you see already how much these things are connected to our iPhone, to iPad, whatever. There are things already connected. Um, it will be more, yeah. Um, in industry, there will be, it will happen. Um, so you have to be enable an easy connection to the machines, which means there have to be embedded applications and analytics into the machine, yeah, and making them self-aware and intelligent to a certain extent. I'll give you immediately an example. Change and update capabilities are then very natural. That has a huge cost aspect to us as well as to the user. Yeah. Uh, delivery can be made much more intelligent, um, better outcomes uh, can be provided, and then um, it can create a whole ecosystem actually of uh, uh, this industrial internet platform can be create a whole ne network and ecosystem of uh, new applications. Comes to the point that at some point you will hear that from your coffee machine that you they unfollowed you. Um, and that, that brings me to this little example that it took me three years until my own sons accepted me as a friend on Facebook, you know, <laughs> after they cleaned up all the images. Um, so, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, but that will happen, actually, uh, and especially in households, uh, a lot of things will be getting connected. There's a key challenge there. Big data does not mean good data. So the real, the real inter important thing, and that's why I like it so much also for the MR world, because MR is a great sensor and a great source of information and data, good data. But you have to make big data to smart data, to actionable information, to things where you can act on, where you have algorithms to act on. So, and if you do that right, you have always a benefit to the increased customer uptime, for example, in systems or in complex systems as well, and you have decreased service costs. For example, um, remote monitoring and diagnostics. Yeah, we do that today already, but you can get that to a totally different level. I forced my own development people now for developing a new system I want uh, they always assume what you need for an MR scanner is electricity and water, cooling water. And I said, add internet. I don't want to have a new scanner which is not connected anymore. Actually, we force in the future our customers to be connected. Otherwise, we cannot start a system, otherwise, whatever. So that's the idea. If you do that, actually, then you have the kind of the base of the connectivity which you can work on on new applications, which will benefit a lot the customers. Uh, Condition-based maintenance is then a next level, actually, because, I mean, reactive maintenance and remote service and controls is, of course, a great thing, but uh, I think there are better ways to do it. 
We do it, for example, in the power generation or in the aircraft engine world at GE. Extremely, I think, uh, and, and if, I, if I'm correct and remember correct, our aircraft, newest aircraft engine has more than 80 sensors continuously monitoring during flight operations with the central headquarter, actually, the situation of the engine, which I feel very good because I fly a lot. Um, asset lifecycle management, scheduling optimization, energy management, process control automation, all these things will come. And I give you a simple example. Actually, it's a big opportunity as well uh, for us as businesses. The, we call that the power of 1%. If you, for example, by connectivity and by the, by, by the fact that things are connected, and Mars or whatever, in this case now rail, if you would be able to promise the customer for a fleet of, of locomotives and trains, a one mile per hour increase of average speed, it's huge saving. It's amazing saving for, for the customers. Or in case of healthcare, uh, predictive maintenance, if that results in just 1% more uptime, it's huge. Yeah? Uh, or diagnostic power for, uh, for uh, industry gas-fired power plants or something like that. This is again huge productivity increase. So it's not just a kind of crazy idea, it is really customer benefit. Since I'm from GE and Edison invented the light bulb, I have this example here. This on the left hand side, it's the old world. You get 60 watt continuously. In the light bulb, there's zero line of code. <laughs> there's no software, no intelligence. So, what happens if you put 100 CPUs in there? 100 terabyte of information, 100 hertz, whatever, trick array, and 100 apps and analytics. You come to a software defined illumination situation, and not just one light bulb. And actually, if you can do that with 1 to 11 watts and have the same outcome as with a 60 watt kind of stupid light bulb. Yeah? So, uh, but you need 20 million line of code. <laughs> so, that's basically the difference. Uh, you need to be connected, individually connected, and you have to create this continuous algorithmic update of the situation. Um, think about that in a world of MR, of CT, of healthcare, uh, with remote into the house, into the homes. Those are the things which, which you're talking about. And last but not least, it will be a disruption uh, with this rise of the, of the connectivity. Um, uh, of digital, it creates new market transformations. And uh, in digital health, actually, business model will, will disrupt. And they will disrupt in the sense that products are disrupting. I told you about this Nike Fuel Band. This is more a lifestyle topic, but if you have, uh, for example, a diabetic monitoring system at home, a very cheap one, that brings things out of the hospital to the private area. And not only in the hardware, but also in the business model. So actually with the connectivity, things will move also more out and faster out of the hospital into the home and the retail. And this will make huge opportunities possible. I, I, I just give you one example at the end of it, a crazy example. I don't even know if it exists already in the Silicon Valley, to be honest, but you probably all know Uber. Um, and uh, what about an Uber for MR and CT or nuclear systems? Think about the following. There are empty slots on each system. If anybody tells me from my customers they have 100% full systems, I don't think so. So what, what happens if you can notify uh, this and then an intelligent system has demand patients and you kind of manage that through in an intelligent way? Could be a way going forward. Necessary thing is, to be connected and having, so to say, this software and algorithmics and rule-based system which can help you to make it work. So that's a little bit more blue sky and out there, but we are convinced that GE Healthcare, GE in total and GE more, that those IT-based, sensor-based, actuator-based, Internet of Things ideas and new software worlds will revolutionize not only the world but especially also our MR in healthcare business. So, to summarize, I hope I gave you a little insight from very technical to very IT that uh, MR is a fascinating technology that we at GE are kind of betting on that one. I'm, I, I personally like it a lot, my whole team is behind there. 
And healthcare is a great place for innovations, especially because you always can argue that those innovations are really helping individuals and patients, and that's good. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for maybe two quick questions, then uh, Dr. Hausman will be available for an uh, informal meeting with everybody. Our next session starts at 11, so we still have some time. Fantastic. Thank you for the talk. It was very exciting. I really enjoyed listening to uh, uh, about some of the research you're talking about. A, a general question, uh, could you comment on if and how the, uh, the research strategies at GE have changed with respect to uh, or, or in response to the recent healthcare changes in the U.S. particularly? Um, yeah, as I, as I tried to, to explain, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, markets are changing. Uh, and, and situations are changing, and it, it's never a stable situation. It was never a stable situation. I remember 15, 20 years ago, there was another, I think it was Hillary effect or so, now it's Obama effect, you know, those kind of, it happened again. Uh, uh, so there's always cost pressure in healthcare. We, since I'm in healthcare, I always felt that we have to lower costs and, and make more productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's nothing really new for us. We have to cope with it. And coping with it means that we have to have our costs under control, that's clear. But at the same time, the, the, the recipe for success is getting one closer to the customers. That is the change which we do. For example, with the fast works, getting closer to the customer's needs and to the market needs and being global also. Because yes, healthcare is very much changing in the United States. Uh, at the same point in time, uh, there's a huge market demand in China, for example. So, um, and we are a very global company, and so we can we can kind of manage that a kind of in a certain way. But for us, the big belief, innovation is still the driver. Technical innovation and process innovation, IT innovation also, uh, but we have to get closer to the customers to understand what at the end of the day, using those technology is the benefit for the customer. And if you do that right, we have all possibility to be successful, even in this very critical world. Uh, thank you so much for outstanding talk. Uh, one of the challenges that a researcher and engineer and clinician are confronted with is the variability of the uh, image-driven indices uh, uh, actually, MR, I, I can say, MI driven indices, uh, the variability of that uh, to the choice of magnet and pulse sequences and different things. And is there any will or attempt for GE to uh, address this challenge in collaboration with different vendors? You mean, uh, if I understand you correct, I mean the. the yeah, but when it comes to uh, quantitative image analysis, yeah. uh, there are always. Yeah. Variability between yeah yeah problems. yeah. Uh, I mean, there are variabilities within a system or within a company in different systems. There are probably even bigger variations between different vendors. Yeah, I know. Uh, this is something which uh, which I think the societies have to address a bit because we cannot directly talk to our competitors so easily. Uh, and uh, but but the, the there is a tendency uh, which we strongly feel and and push forward now is quantitative and more and quantitative MR needs standardization. So uh, we are pushing that in the uh, SMR, uh, ISMRM and, and in different forms uh, forward. It's not an easy task. It starts with just the names of the pulse sequences. They are not synchronized, right? <laughs> That's a little marketing aspect. But uh, yes, we, the, answer, the long answer short, yes, we are trying it to push it, the channels which we have. And we go for us, we go really much into the simplifi simplifying our structures and uh, going towards quantification, which is absolute then. And as, as soon as it's absolute, it should be better comparable. Also. 